welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us for this Q&A of Shorts Program 3. I would just like to quickly reintroduce our guests. From Scumboy, we have Alison Swank. From Souvenir Souvenir, we have producer Amiel Tenenbaum. From Trade Center, we have Adam Barron. From the gallery that destroys all shame, we have co-directors Aurora Brockman and Jesse Zinn. From Mama, we have Pablo de la Chica. And from The One Who Crossed the Sea, we have Jonas Riemer. Thank you all so much for being here today. These short films are so different and each really has such a distinct style. Um, we have fascinating characters and subjects and several offer what feels like a privileged peek into communities that maybe we ordinarily wouldn't know of. Um, what you all were able to accomplish opening up these worlds, but kind of bound by the limitations of what a short film is, is so remarkable. So really congratulations on these films. Um, I just want to start this conversation with a question for all of you. Each of these films had to begin somewhere. Um, so uh, how did these incredible stories come to you and prompted, what prompted you to make this particular film? So uh, let's just move through the order of the program and start with Allison. Um, Allison, you end your film with this lovely tribute to Scumboy made possible with his extraordinary generosity. Um, could you talk about how you found this artist and how you decided to make this film? Yeah, um, so I've had the honor and privilege to be um, dear friends with, with Scummy for um, several years now. And when I first met him, he wasn't a digital 3D artist. And over the course of time, I saw him sort of develop his craft more and started to realize that like the wonderful person that I know is expressing himself in this like really, really interesting at times like obscene and but very like incredible way. And, um, you know, with the hard lockdown here in South Africa last year, um, uh, I just, we decided we would make this film together to tell his story. And, you know, he's a totally unique character, but I feel like his views and um, the stuff he has, you know, to express are representational of like a larger generational narrative that I thought was important. Yeah, absolutely. And Amiel, uh, you know, since you produced the film, I'd, I'd love to hear about how maybe you became involved and what you know about the kind of inception of it. Yeah, so Souvenir Souvenir is a very autobiographic film. And Bastien, the director, I'm, I'm working with him for several years on many different projects. And we had another big project together and he had troubles to find his place on this difficult subject. And then he said, one day he told me, you know, it's exactly like this story that I never was, I never managed to tell and to make a film into. And I was curious about this story. And that was the first uh, draft of the script he, he wrote. And then we began to produce and make the film, which is also about making a film. So the film took three years to produce. So a lot of things happening in the film were actually happening making it. So it's a very, very uh, unique way of making a film about a film while making the film that's about it. And for me, it was very interesting to follow and support Bastien in his own search of himself, of his, his personal story and of what is hiding from himself. And because I think he still, he still uh, doesn't really know everything that he has hidden from himself. So it's a, a I, I'm not sure we finished the film, at least not in his, the, the story is not finished, maybe in 20 years or so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and Adam, that your film could be about cruising in the World Trade Center and still be kind of a beautiful memorial film is really incredible. Um, it's absolutely a story I've never heard of before. And how did it come to you? Um, well, the first story that I heard uh, was actually written and it's part of the text that's used in the film by um, by Billy Miller, who was uh, uh, the editor of a, a underground gay zine that collected uh, true stories of cruising and, and sex. Uh, for years, um, and um, he he wrote this article uh, about the uh, about the Trade Center and a, kind of the guide to all the different spaces that were in the the World Trade Center where people went and cruised. And um, I read that article about ten years ago, and just always had sort of thought, how do how do I make this a film? And um, 
you know, right before the pandemic struck, I sort of had this idea of, of like that this would also be like my our you know, our trip to uh, cruise what cruise what is there at the World Trade Center now and kind of seek to contrast and compare some of the spaces that are there now with what his text is. And then during the uh, pandemic, uh, which struck very, very shortly after we had shot everything, um, I, you know, wasn't able to interview more people kind of in person. And so I just started to do like kind of recorded phone calls, looking, reaching out to people in various networks that, you know, I figured might have cruised at the World Trade Center. And so we uncovered all these stories and, and selected a bunch to kind of prepare the journey around the Trade Center. Um. Um, and uh, next, I'd like to go to Jesse and Aurora with the gallery that destroys all shame. How did you find this um, incredible support group and determine that you would make a film out of this? Well, the, the way that we came to the film is that we had to make a film because Aurora and I are both students at Stanford University in the MFA Dark Film Program. And we were in our winter quarter of last year and it was the co-directed quarter. So we had to pair up with someone to make a film. And Aurora and I came together because we both had a shared interest in telling stories that meet at the intersection of intimate stories with um, reproductive health. And we had a friend who'd attended one of these classes in LA and we were both just immediately struck by the intimacy and the safe space of the class and also just how unique it is of a space and we were very drawn to it from the get-go and I'll, I'll let Aurora continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, we'd been invited to attend the class and had both been squeamish. So we had actually never attended prior to when we were there to shoot it. So it was totally new to us at the time that we filmed. Um, we were also sort of experiencing it with like the awe and unease and everything that sort of is there that you might imagine, we were sort of experiencing that for the first time as well. So it was it was like, a, it was a really beautiful experience to be there and um, yeah, to share in that really intimate and vulnerable space with them. Um, and Pablo, you have such a wonderful central subject with Mama Zawadi. Um, but I think your film could have just as easily been about the chimpanzee refuge. Um, how did you come to make this particular film? Well, uh, this is a promise for uh, one of the main characters, Lorena. Uh, many years ago in a crazy night in, Kam in Kampala in Uganda, when I began my shooting my first film, my first feature film, uh, Lorena come, uh, listen to my Spanish accent, and say, you are from Madrid, like me, and I have a story for you, and, and tell me a story of Mama and the Santuario of Lido. And, and all the team is a, a really specific uh, and a special uh, story, and I promise to Lorena to, one day I come back to uh, Congo to shoot in the story of Mama. And four years, uh, with a lot of uh, hard work because the guerrilla is really close to the santuario and the situation is, is terrible. Uh, uh, I pick up my, my team and go to Congo with uh, and uh, put all the cameras in the back because it's, it's prohibited uh, shooting in, in, in Congo and South Kivu and shooting the story of Mama. Now this is a, uh, this is more a story about, uh, about light. Um, I love more than it's, it's really easy to go for Africa for me to shoot in films uh, and show the, the poor things and the black things and the darkness and the war. And I try to see the other side of the of the story, the other side of the uh, this 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 kind of stories. Yeah, absolutely. Mama just seems to kind of radiate love and to see that relationship it, she has with the chimpanzees. And it's, diff and it's really difficult shooting with a baby chimpanzee, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jonas, you're, this is such a fantastic story that is kind of the premise of your film. Could you talk about how it came to you? Well, it came to me like years ago, I think when I was a child, uh, my parents told me about the journey of my uncle who fled from East Germany to Western Germany 
in the 80s and I was really curious about the story never heard it from my uncle himself and then like I don't know two or three years ago I heard um, that he um, is part of the right-wing party in Germany and that was really weird for me and I was really wondering how could that be and I started to be um, interested in this um, yeah in this kind of double identity of this person because on the one hand he is a um, a guy who is a refugee basically who, who left everything behind and, and had this very brave journey going through um, over the Baltic Sea and on the other hand he's also a guy who is today kind of afraid of foreigners and he's um, against picking up refugees from the Mediterranean Sea and this was kind of bizarre to me and I, I wanted to figure out what's going on with this person and try somehow to understand this. And um, I also saw in it as an opportunity for myself to come a bit out of my comfort zone because before I, I just uh, made some uh, one um, a fictional short film. And so this was my first documentary and that was also really a big challenge for me to go and do this, yeah. Wow. Um, I want to ask next about actually constructing these films, how you conceived of taking these stories and translating them through your own personal vision. So that's kind of whether you'd like to speak to the sound, the imagery, or the editing. Um, so let's go back to Allison. Um, you incorporated so beautifully Scumboy's artwork with your visual style. Could you talk about how you approached that? Yeah, I think I just wanted to show, um, you know, he has a really lively interior world that comes through in the artwork. And then also this very like pretty normal home life. And because we were all sort of locked inside at the time that it was filmed, um, I just wanted to draw a connection between like his interior world and his exterior world and how, where those two meet in the middle and how he expresses himself in one way in his artwork in that, but maybe where that um, overlaps or um, doesn't overlap with like who he is as like a person because um, I think that for he himself even as an artist and as a person and as a trans man there's a lot of like overlapping and um, you know contradictions here and there's just a lot of stuff going on there that I, I think we tried to our best to bring to life in the editing so the editing I mean was like very big important part of the film and how to integrate the exterior world in the in the interior world. Yeah. Um, and Amiel, uh, if you could talk about the animation, I know that there's kind of like distinct different styles, you know, throughout the course of the film. How did that kind of come together? Well, the from the beginning, Bastien wanted to make sure that there is a difference um, in the animation and in the feeling of what he, he had, um, he fantasized as a young adult. So this is all the more cartoonish, uh, violent, uh, not really dark. It, it, he wanted to make it darker at first, but then he, he came back on it and, and he worked with a, a special team that designed and, and changed the, the design, the graphic design. And, um, and the other uh, part is, is the, the, it's the real world. Um, this real world, he wanted to make it look like real. Um, I mean, not look, but feel real. So he used, we used um, textures from a painter and a comic, uh, a graphic novel writer from Argentina, uh, Jose Gonzalez. We used his, his paintings, uh, not as a global uh, pictures, but always we used the textures, small pieces that Bastien recreated the animation with. So technically it's a very, very complex process because uh, first Bastien made uh, animatic, uh, well, uh, um, yeah, animatic. And then he, he, he made all the animation in 3D with um, potatoes, uh, people, and then he repainted everything or not with a, 
uh, a real painting, but he, he made all the compositing. It's a very, very complex process with many layers. And when you watch the film, you see all those layers and all they all come together. And well, as I said, it's the three years production. So the style um, moved, changed. Also, it's about his own life and how he changed when is uh, when he grew up so the style is changing his vision is changing and we always tried to have um, some kind of beauty in the image but uh, it's uh, sometimes bastien had troubles because he didn't want it to be beautiful some some things are really ugly in the film i mean in 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 the sense of what he wanted to express uh, but it was a, an interesting process and following that and, and, and coming back at it. Uh, and I'm very happy with what, what we got. And it's quite different from what we wanted. But the, the best thing we, one of the greatest thing about the film, about the graphic is that the Jose Gonzalez, the, the author of the first paintings or creation in this day is is very happy with the results it didn't it didn't draw anything for our film we just used his his um, drawings and paintings but he's very happy he feels that it's a film animated on his style which is i think true but this is also uh the i, I don't know exactly how to say the the technical um, aspect that Bastien has is, is uh, very, very talented to make, give life into those paintings. And that's, uh, yeah, that, that was very interesting process. Yeah. Adam? Um, well, you know, I think that, that um, the construction of the film, I mean, I talked about, you know, we sort of collecting these narratives and collecting these stories and, um, but, you know, I think in terms of the conception of the film, I really wanted to create a kind of feeling of um, that you can't really quite go back and achieve or, or, or visualize the, the, um, the richness of the experiences being described, that everything, uh, aside from some, you know, images uh, of the World Trade Center from the past that opened the film, um, I really wanted people to kind of feel this sense of like this anxiety that is produced when you're sort of going, okay, when is the filmmaker going to cut to shots of the seventies? When are we going to see all this kind of stock footage that sometimes pops up in films about gay life in the seventies and you're actually never getting it. You're just getting more stores, more commerce, more kind of a memorialization of um, the, the tragedy of 9-11, uh, which uh, was horrible, but I think, you know, in doing so by the end, you kind of realize that maybe there is some erasure of a whole community and a whole network, a secret network that formed and that that kind of extends to, you know, the city at large, maybe the country in the, you know, now post 20 years, almost we're coming up on the 20 year anniversary of 9-11 and the way it changed the, the city uh, was really dramatic and, you know, all about gentrification and all about um, making it more impossible for people to live who are on the fringe, on the margins, you know, and um, so that, you know, it was all kind of uh, uh, deliberate in the construction of the film that way. Yeah. Um, Jesse and Aurora, um, you have a kind of mystical, magical tone to this film. How did you go about creating that? Yeah. Um... I think that we wanted the film for the most part to, to replicate the experience of being a participant in the class. We wanted it to feel immersive and we didn't want it to feel voyeuristic or exploitative because the stories are so vulnerable and the people that we were filming, many of them, almost all of them we met for the first time the night we were there. And so we didn't have time to build a rapport over weeks or months, you know? So we really wanted to, to sort of replicate that feeling. And so where we positioned the camera and the way we, we edited, we wanted it to create that. But um, 
there's also a point in which the class becomes just like totally surreal. I mean, the experience of being in a room with everyone like sharing the most intimate parts of their body that for most of us, we never or very rarely ever see and never in this kind of context where we're there to like sort of examine in both a clinical way, but also experience in this like very kind of almost spiritual way is very interesting. So um, we wanted to both bring in this very grounded feeling, but also put elements of the surreal that you very much feel when you're there. And I think it reflects um, really our experience of being in the class too and the feelings that we had um, as sort of participants as well as like people documenting. I don't know if Jesse has thoughts to add as well. Yeah, I mean, as Aurora said, it was very much like an inside out kind of process that we had always wanted to approach the film with. And of course, we did a lot of preparation, but there was so much that was left up to chance. As Aurora said, we had no idea whether anyone would even pitch on the night of the class or it was, you know, an entirely new experience for us too, with everyone coming into the class for the first time and meeting everyone. And we also, I think, wanted to extend that kind of grounded approach within the way that we were meeting and interacting with the participants. So Aurora and I both had decided that we would implement a structure of um, flexible consent throughout the class and also that would extend beyond just the shooting of the film into the post-production process. So from the get-go, we expressed to the participants that if anyone at any point felt uncomfortable or had opted, wanted to opt out of the filming, they could um, give us a hand signal, some sort of a gesture, and that we would honor that because I think that this, sometimes the concept of consent as it extends to filmmaking can, I think, be um, black and white when often, of course, things change in the moment, especially when you're in such a vulnerable position and you're being filmed so intimately. So we, we really wanted to extend the ethos of consent and mutual respect into the way that we also conducted our approach to the filmmaking process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Pablo, you have these incredible scenes of nature, but there's also this kind of looming danger in the background. Could you talk about how you kind of carried that over into the look and feel of your film? Well, the, the, the original idea is uh, it's complicated to go to shooting in Africa when all the night at around six o'clock, everything is dark and you are close to a guerrilla uh, of rebel of uh, Rwandan uh, guerrilla, uh, close to like seven kilometers, pretty close, like 10 minutes in, in a car. And, and in the night began to listen bullets on the fire. Um, you feel like um, you're not in the middle of the war because I shooting in Syria again and, and a couple of places more dangerous than Congo. But the thing is, I try to make a, uh, try to make a two different walls. One is the day when mama have his special war with his baby teams and the night is the night is the moment to dangerous moment. This is the nightmares and maybe the more difficult place. It's try to show two different type of wall. And the other idea is try to make evolution of our mama uh, have the possibility to, to express about uh, his own situation because it's really uh, violent and horrible uh, background. And in the same way, the magical moment to reborn when began to work in with the baby teams. Yeah. Um, Jonas, uh, could you talk about your animation? It's so beautiful. Um, and at some point, it really takes this fantastic turn. Yeah, I wanted to tell the story in a very objective way. So um, I chose to tell it in this uh, God's eye view the whole time. So we have this distance uh, from the audience to the protagonist. And um, what I like about it is that the, the protagonist becomes very small and interchangeable because it could be anyone else's story. It could happen somewhere else. It could happen at another time. It could happen today and or it happens today. And so I had this uh, very long, slow shots from like a drone 
because I also think in animation, there are usually not those long shots and drone shots is also something really unusual in animation. So there was also some argument to do it. And the beginning of the film is kind of, yeah, it tries to be a bit more realistic and tells the story in a very chronological way. And then um, we like um, go into the other time, like uh, 30 years later, and then uh, suddenly the animation becomes more surreal and things start to be more weird and drift apart and things happen we cannot understand. And yeah, and I, I try to um, make, um, create some subtle critique uh, with the images, but I think everyone has to make up their own minds about this person and decide, okay, what, on what side am I? Or um, yeah, what's right or wrong? And, and to see all the nuances between black and white that's what I also like about the, the black and white images. And, um, but I also wanted to show him as a human being somehow because some of his political opinions in my way are really horrible. And, uh, but I also wanted to show him as a human being. That's why I end with this sentence where he says, oh, I'm really happy that someone finally listens to me because obviously no one ever and listen to him in the last, I don't know, 30 years or something. Yeah, that's yeah. a really powerful way to end the film. Um, I want to ask one more question about each film before we close out the discussion. Um, so let's go back to Allison. Um, you're an artist making a film about an artist. Um, was there any kind of control that you gave Scumboy or was he a part of the process in any way? And if not, you know, kind of just what does he think of the ultimate film? Yeah, um, you know, uh, no. To put it, to put it simply, no. That he didn't really have control over it. At, but insofar as like visuals and stuff, but he always had like sort of consent and sign off on everything that was done. So like every step of the way, I was showing him what I was doing and how the story was being shaped and what visuals were being used. And he was, he like was you know, um, giving his feedback in that way. Um, you know, just by nature of who he is, he's so easygoing in this way that's almost like, wow. <laughs> like, but also like, I, I was just very cognizant of the fact that while he may be easygoing, this is also like, um, it's, it's a sensitive story and it has to be treated with such like care and respect and it's intimate and he allowed me to be there and film these intimate scenes and that's an honor and that, um, you know, the ultimate goal was to promote his art and promote his view of the world in such a way that was um, inspiring for others. So no, he did not have any control over stuff, but he consented all along. And there was a mutual understanding that the end goal of the film was to promote his messaging for the world. Yeah, sorry. I think the word I would, should have used was collaboration. <laughs> um, yes, but uh, yeah, that's really great. Um, you know, that he was so easygoing and it's a really a beautiful portrait. Um, and uh, Amiel, uh, there is a moment in, in your film that's really powerful where they talk about the kind of unspeakable shame that's protected by the first generation. This is Bestian's personal film, as you mentioned. Um, kind of, I'm curious about the conversations that he's had with his family after it. Yeah, it's, uh, we're all curious about those, those conversations. Actually, uh, that didn't happen. There, there was, he showed the film to uh, his family. Um, unfortunately, during the process of, of the, making the film, both his grandparents died. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, the film was quite advanced and a lot of discussion and they were all very supportive of the film, uh, especially his grandmother that died almost uh, a month before we finished. But uh, the parents, his parents, his, his father never said anything really, even after, after even watching the film. And, and the weird thing is the father is making his own voice, saying things that are, he should realize 
that saying those uh, is he should realize this taboo of, of this impossibility of discussing or or his shame or the shame of the father or grandfather but he, he didn't say anything so he's still not saying the father not the grandfather but the father so discussion there is with the the second generation with the sister with the with other people that we realized uh, while making the film that uh, people our age had, had their own grandparents making being a part of, of this war and and they don't say much but we talk a bit more maybe yeah and um adam there is such a kind of <laughs> there's such a political protection around the conversation of 9-11. Um, and this is the 20th anniversary, as you mentioned. Have you already received any pushback on this film? Um, you know, so far I haven't actually. I'm, I'm actually really surprised because I, I did sort of anticipate that. But I think that the film, you know, um, is like we were very careful, like I don't, I don't really want to exploit the tragedy of 9-11 and we really deliberately kind of tried to avoid imagery of, of um, you know, anything related to the actual, you know, um, attack, uh, you know, and so none of that really appears in the film. And um, so, yeah, so far, so far it's been very positive and I'm actually really surprised by that. I think it's, you know, the fact that it's able to, screen at um, festivals like AFI uh, and, and you know, the positive reactions we've been having at, at festivals seem to just indicate that um, people are more able to discuss uh, uh, topics like cruising and um, things that have been previously just so hidden underground um, uh, and not talked about by the sort of main society. I think if there's any pushback, it might be from uh, within the gay community, um, sort of strains of the of the culture who are more um, afraid uh, of having the pushback or or having something like 9/11 and the World Trade Center being linked to um, this culture of of uh, free sexuality, which um, offends uh, many within the gay community who want to be seen as normal or accepted within the straight society and don't want these kind of strains coming out. Um, but we haven't really received anything, you know, from the kind of more right wing political uh, side and uh, hopefully we don't. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great to hear. Um, Aurora and Jesse, um, could you tell us a little bit more about this wonderful support group or class, I suppose? Um, are there classes all over the country or are there ways people can kind of join? Yeah, so this particular class is pretty much exclusively held in LA. It's, uh, it's run by a group of incredible, mainly doulas, birth doulas in LA. And it's very much a, you know, a volunteer run kind of group. Uh, it's not, it's nonprofit. It's very much run by people who are very committed and passionate about um, adult sex ed and also just the broader kind of project of dismantling taboo subjects surrounding bodies and vulvas and all of these issues that the film explores. Unfortunately, because of COVID, there hasn't been any more in-person classes. So we were actually very fortunate to film the very last in-person class. And in a way that has made the film all that more special because it's this time capsule of this moment when all of these like physical bodies could join for this incredibly intimate moment of sharing stories and also just bearing witness to each other's testimonies because that is so much what the class is about and what the film really is about. It's about what the act of witnessing can do in order to dismantle shame and taboo topics surrounding shame. I don't know, Aurora, would like to add anything? To that? Yeah, um, no, I agree with everything that Jesse said. This is a singular class, although um, it's unfortunate that because of the pandemic, the one that we were able to record was the last one ever held in person. 
Um, they have been held on Zoom since then, which I'm sure is a totally different experience in and of itself. Um, and because of that, it is now accessible to people all over the world in theory. And I do think that people from all over have been attending and um, the woman who runs the class, a woman named Pamela, ha I've, I've seen this through her Instagram, has been able to like set up like speculum sort of drop-offs where if you're gonna attend the class in another major city, you can like pick up a speculum to attend. So um, the class is called Take Back the Speculum. And if anyone's interested potentially, um, you could probably find it through Instagram or online. Uh, but yeah, it's incredible, but it does come from a long lineage of people who have been doing this kind of um, like personal exploration of our bodies because there is such limited information or so much disinformation and so many medical texts and the typical sex ed we get is so inadequate in understanding what vaginas and vulvas, how they function and how we experience pleasure and all of these things. So although this particular class is singular, I know that there is a history of this work being done for a long time. And in fact, there's an older woman in the class who speaks and she uh, was one of the founders of sort of classes like this um, in the, I believe like 60s and 70s. And so she was a sort of like a pioneer. We don't hear that part of the story from her in the course, but um, she was sort of a pioneer of this kind of movement of people examining their own bodies. Oh, that's amazing to have her in the film. Um, uh, Pablo, I, I I want to ask about the situation now in this national park and uh, with the Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center and with Mama Zawadi. Do we have any updates on how everything is going over there? Yeah, I have a group a group of WhatsApp, not with Mama because Mama don't have a WhatsApp. Uh, but right now uh, the situation is uh, a little bit good. But the last year is terrible because the military coming inside the national park in, in Cozy Viega and close to the sanctuary. And it's terrible because you see uh, uh, like a thousand of uh, soldiers with guns and you need and the chimpanzee and the baby and the and the all the uh, all the workers of the sanctuary is is hard working with uh, with guns. And it's, it's normally it's, uh, difficult work with the, with the guerrilla really close, but it's, the situation is like a feeling like a war. And in the same, in, in the same time, you need protect and, and the, the chimpanzee. Right now, I uh, have a really good uh, uh, working. Uh, Lorena make a new house for, uh, for uh, support. The, no, the, um, a, a specific therapy for uh, for women and children for uh, uh, sexual aggression and uh, have a really good um, uh, welcome for the community of uh, of Lido because sometimes when what the you know uh, outsiders the name is Musungus Musungu is the name the nickname for when you go for Africa to shooting and uh, sometimes uh, feel uh, we are when you try to support uh, the community because uh, it's really close the genocide of Rwanda, national, uh, the blue helmets don't do nothing, the guerrilla is really close. And sometimes you see white is white is is similar than war sometimes. And this is really good for the community. I have a special uh, psychological workshop with the, a lot of close to 100 children. And now the situation is a little bit good. But in the, on the other side, to recover the chimpanzee, this is the moment, maybe the worst moment because work really close to Virunga. Is the same, it maybe the, sometimes it's the same team. And now the last year is close to 25 uh, baby teams. It's a lot. This is a lot. But hopefully sometime the people understand uh, don't, don't use Africa and don't use Congo to, uh, to make a war. Maybe to understand Congo is one of the, maybe it's the heart of this, this planet. And Jonas, this final moment in your film is so powerful with the water rising up and the walls coming up. Um, you're almost kind of having a conversation with your uncle. Um, did, what were his thoughts on the film and you know, in particular on this kind of perspective? Oh, well, he did see the film just a couple of days ago, but I didn't receive a feedback yet. 
And it's interesting that you say it's kind of a conversation because it's, I have a feeling that it's hard to have a conversation with him because he's a very, he has a very special temper and it's, it's, uh, I'm a good listener, I think, but it's not the other way around. <laughs> so I think I did the film mainly for me to understand him. And I, I think he, I'm not sure if he will understand the film or see the critique in it. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm curious to, um, to talk with him about it. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for taking the time to speak with me today and really congratulations on these wonderful films. We are so honored to be presenting them as a part of AFI Docs. Uh, and thank you to our audience for being here today. Please visit our website at docs.afi.com for more opportunities to interact with these films, audiences and filmmakers, and of course, to watch more films. If you love the shorts program like we do, please tell your friends that this and all of the shorts programs are available to screen throughout the entire festival. And we would love to hear from you on social media at hashtag AFI Docs. Thank you guys. <laughs>